Good evening. I've been waiting for this for 25 years. I brought my guest, a man that uh, I wouldn't be here for and for him. He taught me 25 years ago. He validated my passion for social justice. Basically told me I wasn't crazy. And um, Rudy Lombard, Dr. Lombard, would you stand up, please? <laughs> <laughs> so, you've had that coming, Rudy. You're probably wondering why this old geezer is standing up here holding the box of cereal. <laughs> and uh, it's because it, I'm here to make a point. And uh, from the farmer's point of view, it doesn't make any difference whether this box of cereal or any box of cereal or is full or empty. This almost $5 box of cereal, the farmer accrues three cents. And it's indicative of a much deeper problem. And that problem is that we have a nationally centralized industrial-based food system that uh, now has us producing monocrops. Monocrops are the logic of growing uh, thousands of acres of the same crop in the same field. And it's quite dangerous. And we'll talk about that. But um, this came from a uh, conference in Detroit where I found out that uh, Detroit has no supermarkets. One third of the population does not have cars. And so how do they get food? Well, from your local gas station and from a convenience store. And uh, the person narrating the story said who he really felt sorry for is the teachers that have to deal with kids that have eaten candy on the way into schools at breakfast. So if you're poor, you already know we have a, a very deep problem with monocropping and uh, that has created urban deserts because of the, of the uh, centralized and what I'll call industrial agriculture. Industrial agriculture has a number of characteristics, one of which it's heavily mechanized. It follows um, industrial age mass production techniques and uh, it is heavily dependent on fossil fuels. In fact, um, arguably, not between 19 and 22 percent of all fossil fuels used in this country uh, are for either the cultivation or transportation of food. So, you already know, if you're urban, poor, and minority, that our food distribution system is broken. It just doesn't know it yet. And it doesn't know it for a variety of reasons, but one of it is because you subsidize it. And um, right now, there's two characteristics of this broken food system that you continue to subsidize. And one is that 95% of all the caloric intake in the United States of America comes from 30 different crops. It's hard to believe. How did we get like this? You heard an earlier speaker talk about millions of different varieties. 30. The second thing you may not be aware of is that that fossil fuel system we experienced uh, in 2008. When, remember when diesel went up to uh, $4.50 a gallon in North Carolina? And I imagine it was much higher here. But uh, our customers quit complaining about our prices. So that uh, we are moving, how long do you think we're going to be able to subsidize, subsidize oil? So um, at 450, we're just about half of what the Europeans pay for, for, for um, oil. And all this is based on a system that was developed in the 60s, about the same time as our Dr. Parkinson was talking about when our health began to decline, um, where when oil was less than $3 a barrel, and we're still doing it. So you've got a system that's broken. If you look at the picture, uh, you'll notice this is industrial agriculture, but 40% of the entire field is dedicated 
to the use of mechanized equipment. So it's not particularly efficient. The system is broken. We hit a milestone this year. We put a billion pounds of poison on our crops. I was reading an article recently that said in 2006, the EPA reported that the 33,000 acre strawberry crop, the one they grow for the wintertime, you know those big red ones that, well, that's all they are, red, they have no taste and they're hollow in the middle? Yeah. Well, they'll still make you want some to eat some this winter. The, the, uh, that crop uh, was the recipient of 9 million pounds of poison. Makes you feel like drinking wine right away, doesn't it? So it's broken. All right. And uh, I didn't want to get involved in this. This is what I thought I was doing. I finished a telecommunications career. I'd become a teacher in inner city Miami. And I'd saw the movie Last of the Mohicans. <laughs> and uh, with Daniel Day-Lewis and Madeline Stowe and and I uh, went out and bought 45 acres, three miles from that picture. And I thought I was going to be a high school teacher with, um, uh, and, and uh, I was going to grow ginseng, grow uh, shade-driven, shade-loving crops. And, uh, but I, that, that's when I found out that beneath all that uh, beauty was the fact that, you know, the textile industry in this country collapsed. Well, that's where it collapsed. Starting in 1995, we're still at about 18% unemployment 15 years later. We're the belt buckle of the Bible belt, so you know that the ministers out there, which is 200 over a 550 square mile county, uh, they know for some reason or another um, exactly how much their, their flock makes, and they think that there's closer to 30% unemployment. And then I came to know the Appalachian people, and I'm so proud to be here and speak to their uh, in, to speak uh, in their behalf. Because, and I thank you for coming here and becoming part of our struggle, because we need to fix this. I ended up becoming a rural economic developer, and I said, "Well, let's take an assessment." Well, one thing we had going for us was in the Appalachian agrarian tradition. I deal with farmers that have been on their land for 300 years. I deal with one farmer that doesn't have a deed. He has a royal charter still. All right. So um, we had 6,000 families that still owned between 5 and 20 acres of land. And we had proximity. We were 75 miles from an urban magnet called Charlotte. And not too far from Asheville. I went and talked to the chefs in Charlotte. And they said, well... We can't get fresh food. And I thought, well, if we can teach the farmers how to farm again, because over 100 years of industrialization in the textile mills, they had forgotten how to farm. Well, then we could make jobs, called, make businesses called small farms, which is what we did. But we said, we're not going to follow the paradigm. We're going to break the mold here. And whereas that other system of large factory farms that produces 90% of your food... Um, uh, we're going to go with small businesses, small family farms. And rather than go through a multi-tiered distribution system, we're going to sell direct to the customer using what? The Internet. Little did I know. All right. And more importantly, rather than buy your food from anonymous food sources, you don't know where your food comes from. We're going to set it up so that every ounce of that food is you know exactly where it's coming from. You click on the farm that it was produced and it'll take you right to their website and it'll tell you exactly who they are and why they do what they do and their story. All right? So we're going to reduce that distance that now has evolved uh, between where you, where, what you eat and who grows it. I mean, you know more about your plumber than you know about who grows your food. All right? And we're going to go further. We're going to grow sustainably grown food. We're not going to make chemically dependent food because we think that that's going to become very expensive as the price of the barrel of oil, which um, I, would, I would suspect will be rising. And rather than the normal 1,500 miles of travel and 14, 10 to 14 days of delivery, we're going to do just-in-time delivery. We're actually going to let you order it over the Internet, pay for it by a credit card, and... We will pick it 
after you order it. All right? And uh, we're, gonna, we're not doing monocropping. We're going to do it the right way. We're going to grow as many crops as we possibly can learn how to grow. And if we do all these things, we'll be able to increase the amount of money put in a farmer's pocket by 400% just by knocking out all the middlemen. And we're going to revitalize and transform the economies of Appalachia. Whereas our competitive food system, the one you buy 90% of your food from, has destroyed small communities. We're going to rebuild our communities. We're going to get, keep our kids to stay in our communities. Right now, in my county, as beautiful as it is, there's a hole in the population. There are no jobs. So when you turn 18, you have to leave home. If I was back in the Peace Corps, we might call that a symptom of cultural genocide. So we said, let's make a website. And rather than me uh, explain it, if we roll the tape, uh, I'll let my, my, the people that I serve and that my staff serves explain what's going on in their own voices. Rutherford County in the foothills of southwestern North Carolina enjoys an unusually temperate climate that permits an extended growing season. Nearby Charlotte boasts upscale restaurants and creative chefs who want unusual first quality produce. Uh, with our fish. Oh yeah. Just try for the flavor. Tim Will, executive director at Foothills Connect, Rutherford's business and technology center saw that each could benefit from the other, if they could get connected. The answer was to use the internet. Well, the Farmer's Fresh Market Program is a way that we market the products of regional farmers to an urban market 70 miles away in Charlotte through the use of a website that displays the farmer's inventory for the chef or the restaurant to select. It's not just squash and beans. Um, they're growing a lot of things that I can't spell. Mo a lot of things I've never eaten before. But evidently there's people who in this world who have eaten a lot of it. The chefs can get commodity foods through their own distribution system. What they were really looking for was specialty type crops, crops that they cannot get fresh or are even available through their normal distribution system. Can it be fresher? I don't think I don't so, think huh? So. so these beans we actually use uh, in a couple of ways as well. Um, some shiitake mushrooms, which we try to source locally as well. They can get green beans um, out of their distribution system. They were looking for hairy couvert. These are green beans that we would consider very immature. Well, a uh, hairy couvert is a green bean that is uh, a little bit smaller. Um, we don't let it grow as far, I have a special seeds, and uh, it's basically a baby uh, green bean that have much more flavor, uh, that especially used much more in France, but uh, especially to use in a fine dining restaurants. It's the high in uh, of the green beans, I would say. Farmers like Roxanne Paris jumped at this opportunity to learn about new crops and generate new income. The microgreens, the Japanese eggplant, the candy striped beets, different varieties of tomatoes, and the beans. I've planted probably eight or ten different varieties of beans and been able to sell them all. Romano beans, the flat potted ones, uh, one that's out there now that I have some for tomorrow to take to the chefs, Bobis Albange. It's uh, a purple striped bean. I have the Borlato beans out there which are bright fiery red striped, um, which are soup bean. They dry, you dry them. Um, the, a lot of the filet beans, the Harry Colbert's. All right, we got to the Marriott, we got uh, two pounds of Hildor yellow right filets. Here. Kirk Wilson, a farmer and a teacher, left his native Tennessee to manage the farmer's fresh market. He sees it as his chance to help revitalize traditional family farms and an agricultural economy. 
when I came to North Carolina, I'd, I'd, if Cavola Nero had fallen on me, I wouldn't have known what it was. Uh, La Sonata Kale, that's uh, Cavola Nero, black kale. Uh, Hildora filet beans, I'd never heard of that before. Heirloom tomatoes, I'd heard a little about, but I didn't realize that uh, heirloom tomatoes, there were so many and so many different kinds. Farmers were quick to latch on to heirloom tomatoes. I hope that a lot more farmers will get into that, the, the old-timey tomatoes because they, they got such a, a different acid flavor, you know. It's something you can still taste it 20 minutes later if you hadn't eaten nothing but that tomato. The, the taste will still be in your mouth. and It flavors the salads and all the foods a lot better. Beautiful slice. Look at those. How beautiful is that? Look at that, right? And we're going to take each, each tomatoes and then what we're gonna do, we're gonna just, just season them with salt and pepper, all right? And then we're gonna do some, our special molasses from, uh, from the farmer, and we're just gonna do a small drizzle. So with that, you're gonna have that beautiful colors, and that's gonna give a little bit more sweetness on your, on your dish. Dish with a drizzle of truffle oil. Uh, truffle oil. And it smells just great. And we're just gonna serve it like that, very natural, and this is a beautiful heirloom tomato salad. It's, it's something absolutely fantastic to be able to work with uh, produce one, a few hours old. I never seen that before. I travel all around the world and I can tell you this is absolutely unique and it's magic, definitely. The freshness, the quality of the food is just wow. I, I never see that before. Microgreens are one of the most lucrative new crops in Rutherford. The chefs use them to garnish um, plates and to mix in salads to give it that little extra zing and a little extra color. Well, they just basically explode in your mouth because there's so much taste and they're so fresh. Until I came over here, I never joined, I never knew what a microgreen water is. But uh, it, it perked my interest up right quick when I found it on an area that is three foot long and eight foot wide, I could make $70 uh, profit in just a short amount of time, uh, $35 a pound on a three by four area, and then turn around and do it all over again a few weeks, a couple weeks later. So uh, as we intensify uh, their operations, as they become more intensive, um, it's very possible for them to earn a white collar salary on a small amount of acreage. It's not gonna happen overnight. Uh, nobody starts off at that level, that I believe. But uh, as, they, as we learn more about uh, uh, farming the back side of the calendar, uh, when the produce is really in high demand, uh, I believe we will start to see not only uh, <clears throat> 10,000 per acre, as high as 30,000 per acre. Jeff Searcy has been growing tomatoes and other commodity vegetables for nearly 30 years, mostly for packing houses. He and his wife Charlene saw potential in the farmer's fresh market. I grew some fennel, uh, some shallots, some leeks, um, some orange cauliflowers, uh, Cavola Nero Italian kale. Some of the things I've been growing this year I've never even heard of until I picked up a seed book and started doing some research. I thought, well, I'll try that. Some of it's worked out. Uh, I just enjoy it. September through December is peak season in the restaurant business, and Charlotte's chefs are thrilled to have a greater variety of produce. It's, it's a very busy time of year for us with banquets. Um, you know, with summer, a lot of people are on holiday and vacation, so it's the busiest time of year for us. So to have those fall and winter crops available, uh, it's, it's just awesome. Chef Schillinglaw has organized curb markets at his country club and hopes to create a community-supported agriculture program strengthening the bonds between Charlotte's consumers and Rutherford's farmers. Um, recently we started talking about other programs which could lead into chickens and eggs and things like that which you know I'm, I'm super excited about. I just wanted to grow and grow and grow. In addition to top dollar for their produce, the farmers occasionally get top billing at the restaurants. Calvin Harris harvests blueberries from bushes he planted as a boy 39 years ago. You can take them to the farmer's market and get like 18 
dollars a gallon, but through the co-op you can take them and sell them for like $32 a gallon, and they give you $18 a gallon at the farmer's market. So that's, the co-ops really, you know, help people's income. Thanks to the Farmer's Fresh Market and appreciative Charlotte customers, more family farms have a greater chance not only to survive, but to thrive. Look, this color is just magic. Oh, it's not over. What's magic is being between Calvin Harris on one side and Jean Pierre on the other and trying to understand what's going on. <laughs> um, there's a couple keys here. This one you should know about. One of the keys is, you may not be aware of this, one third of the, because you live in a city, you don't even take it, you don't even think about it. One third of the country does not have access to high-speed broadband. In fact, I'll tell you a little dirty secret. You know, how many people have DSL? In Europe, in most instances, DSL is not considered high-speed broadband. All right. So we didn't have any. So we went out and raised $1.44 million. That's the check. That's the board of directors there and um, the guy who's now the lieutenant governor. We raised the money to spread 100 miles of fiber optics in June of, or pardon me, in February of 2007. Not one school had connectivity by 2008. Every school had connectivity, as well as every EMT and every first responder. And once we got connected, then we could increase our market. Because we sell a product that's superior in every way than the industrial food system. Except maybe price, but that's because you're subsidizing it. But the other key is education. We started a sustainable agriculture program in North Carolina. North Carolina, its biggest economy is agriculture. And we are the only high school in the state, in 100 counties, that teaches sustainable agriculture. All right? We, I had never thought as a teacher that I would ever be in a position of teaching people to read so I could teach them how to use a computer so I could teach them how to use the internet, but we did. And we set up a program for uh, farmers called the Farmers Adopting Computer T Training, FACT. And if they pass the course, they get a state computer for free. All right, one of the recycled computers, it's too weak to be able to be uh, um, uh, on a network anymore. But this is where we're going, and I'm running out of time, so I want to make this very quick, because this applies to you too. I flew up here, and not much has changed. You've got a lot of farms out there. And those small family farms, of which are still 1.1 million, they're struggling. All right, because 90% of our food that we buy is this industrial food system that is slowly poisoning us. So you don't have to do anything radical. I'm not saying go out and blow up a silo. All right. All I'm saying is you only have to do three things, and that system will collapse. All you have to do is buy local, buy fresh, and buy environmentally sensitive food, and those other cats can't even get in the arena, let alone play the game. Thank you. <laughs>